Good evening. Welcome to our Holy Thursday worship experience. This is not by the sanctuary by any means. However, as we are in the social distancing and we are worshiping in different kind of ways, I'm reminded that in this story that Jesus sent the disciples ahead to prepare for a comfort meal, something that they knew, uh, which was the Passover meal. And so this evening, I'm inviting you to partake in a comfort meal. Enjoy dinner with those whom you are with in this time and in this space. And you're invited to eat that while we are going along and hearing the story to hit pause for the love feast. And you'll find that liturgy in the comments in the video below or in the email that you received this video. We're filming here because this is a place that we all know here in this community is the place to go find a comfort meal. A place where you get to enjoy the comfort of chicken and dumplings, fried chicken, and all the fixings. So we invite you to come enjoy a comfort meal as we experience Jesus on this holy evening. In the Synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, the disciples are asked to go to prepare a meal, the Passover meal. It's a meal that they were very familiar with, a tradition that had been passed down as a celebration of the Israelites being set free from slavery. The Passover meal had specific customs and traditional food that those who practiced the celebration could always expect to see on the table. And, how, and that is how Jesus could tell them to go and prepare for the meal. They didn't have to ask for a grocery list or, well, what is it that you want to eat or what do you want to eat? They knew what the custom was and what the traditions were for the Passover meal. It's similar to our experience here at the Picket House. We know when we come in, we know what kind of good comfort food we're going to get. We know that there will be the biscuits and the cornbread. We know chicken and two side vegetables and the veggies and the mashed potatoes and all of that delicious stuff that we can gather around the table. There's always room on the benches just for a few more people to slide in. So in this same meal, um, the disciples knew how to go ahead and find just the right space. They knew what would be on the table and what would be expected. I can imagine the disciples were enjoying this familiar meal. They had been on the road going from here to here and it was nice just to go back to a place that felt very familiar. We owe our tradition of saying a grace or a blessing at the table to the Jewish faith. Those who worshiped not only at the temple and at the synagogue, but at, the bless at their family table with a blessing. 
To pray the simplest prayers says a great deal about God and about food as our gift from God. As Methodists, you may be familiar with the words that we say or more often sing, be present at our table, Lord. Be here and everywhere adore. So let's bow for a word of prayer. Lord Jesus Christ, three times a day, you reveal to us that our lives are sustained by the gifts of others. Strangers whose names we will never know. Someone who tilled the land, the soil, and planted the seed. Harvested the wheat, stored the grain and then shipped across the continent, who labored before the break of day to bake the bread and deliver it to the store. Some of these strangers toiled long hours. Some had their bodies broken. Some were paid poorly so that we might, without much effort on our part, break bread today. By your Holy Spirit, remind us how much we owe to you and to those who make our lives possible through their sacrifice. This evening, we remember all the healthcare workers, the leaders of communities who are not able to be around the tables with their loved ones. O oh God, be with them as they continue to serve and sacrifice. God, we recognize that you bless us by the gifts of others. Because we cannot thank them all for making this meal possible, we pause this evening to thank you for all of them and for all of their gifts. Amen. As we reflected this past Sunday and as we reflect on Jesus' teaching throughout the year, it's not uncommon for us to see how Jesus uses what's right in front of him, what's around him, to teach and bless those that are there in front of him who are learning and seeking out a blessing. So it's only to be expected that Jesus would use the dinner table, something very familiar to many, to share his greatest moments of revelation. This evening, I invite you to join with me in a love feast. You might think, what on earth is a love feast? It's a brief ritual offered as a way of breaking bread, especially on a week that we would normally be celebrating the sacrament of Holy Communion while we are in this time of sheltering in place. And it's not something that we often get to do, but it is part of our tradition in the Methodist Church and other denominations to be able to do this when we can't gather as a church within the sanctuary. You will find this brief order of worship in your newsletter or in the comments in this video just below where we will go through this practice. I invite you this evening to either hit pause and participate in a comfort meal and in this love feast liturgy, or you can continue with us here and use this love feast order after we finish here together. As we go to this time, I invite you to hear these hymns as you move towards your table or as you continue with us here. I invite you as you come back together to grab your Bible, open it to John chapter 13. I invite you to grab a couple hand towels and a bowl of water as we listen to this music.
Let us begin this part of our service hearing from the Gospel of John, chapter 13. It was just before the Passover feast. Jesus knew the hour had come for him to leave this world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. The evening meal was in progress, and the devil had already prompted Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, to betray Jesus. Jesus knew that the Father had, pulled, had put all things under his power, and that he had come from God and was returning to God. So he got up from the meal, took off his outer clothing, and wrapped a towel around his waist. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet drying them with the towel that was wrapped around him. He came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus replied, You do not realize now what I am doing, but later you will understand. No, said Peter, you shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered, Unless I wash you, you have no part with me. Then, Lord, Simon Peter replied, not just my feet, but my hands and my head as well. Jesus answered, those who have had a bath need only to wash their feet. Their whole body is clean, and you are clean, though not every one of you. For he knew who was going to betray him, and that was why he said not everyone was clean. When he had finished washing their feet, he put on his clothes and returned to his place. Do you understand what I have done for you? He asked them. I wonder, as we hear this scripture, might be familiar to some of us, how this makes you feel. I think some of us, when we open this scripture verse up in worship and we read it, we might even cringe a little. We might even pull our feet back up underneath us, wondering, oh no. Is a pastor going to ask that I get my feet washed? I wonder how this scripture makes you feel. I wonder as you hear this story, and as I've invited you to grab a bowl of water and a towel, where you find your spirit wondering at this moment. Have you ever wondered about Jesus' timing? He knew someone would betray him. but So why did he wait? Why did he get up right then to wash filthy feet? right then in that moment why not wait till after the betrayal and yet jesus tenderly washed the feet of each and every one of the disciples knowing that one would stand up and walk on the same blessed clean feet and run right out the door to betray him i invite you this evening to think about this story close your eyes if it helps you block out distractions imagine that table maybe like the table when we're here in the bigot house and the volume of friends and family gathering and the fun conversations and the memories that are being made. It's loud and it's a wonderful uh, celebration of just enjoying fellowship. Imagine that laughter and that easy chatter at the table, much like we enjoy. And then see Jesus pick up a bowl and begin to wash the feet, the feet of those on either side of you. And then imagine Jesus being right in front of you. See him kneel down. Feel his eyes as they lock with your eyes. Feel him take your foot. I know many of us might have that feeling to pull our foot away, but I invite you to stay in that moment and not to run from it. As he washes your feet, believe that all things you are trying to keep hidden from the world are being washed away. All the secrets, all the hurts, all the pains. Things that he already knows about that we no longer have to keep from him. Feel the freeness, the spirit and the water renewing us. I invite you to open your eyes and come back into this space. You may want to share with those that you're with this evening how this experience and imagining Jesus washing your feet made you feel. But it is perfectly okay to not want to share that experience, to just be in that moment. And if you're not wanting to share that, I would invite you to journal just a little bit to be able to hold on to it. I can't tell you how many times I said, oh, I'll go back and write. And then when I, I wait a day or a couple days or a week and say, oh, what was that moment? What was that feeling I had? So even if you don't have a fancy journal, just even on the note section in your phone, pick it up and jot just a note about that experience. 
of what it would be like to imagine Jesus right at your feet, offering to wash you clean, to wash away all those fears, um, the shame, the things that we hold close to us that we hope and think that no one sees. I encourage you to lift up one another. It's interesting in this time how we want to hold things closer and tighter, but I invite you to check in on others. And you might be able to ask them, did you have this experience? Was it an encouraging, was it an overwhelming experience? In the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke, we hear in the text, Jesus says, do this. Notice he says, he does not say to overtalk it, to overthink it, to overprocess or overcommit it. Simply do it. Then in verse 17 of the 13th chapter of John, Jesus says, if you know these things, you are blessed if you do them. Maybe Jesus is saying, just do it and let God worry about the rest. Just do it. Let God worry about the rest. Maybe this evening and over the next couple of days, we just go through the scriptures. We just do that and let God take care of the rest. So I invite you when we finish here of washing the feet of those in your home or the hands, if you're more comfortable with that, um, that you just receive that act of love and service. It is one that humbles us. It's not always something that's comfortable, but imagine not only the act of serving one another, but receiving that act of love. I find that receiving that act is just as um, powerful of experience as serving another person. I would encourage you this evening also to continue reading. John 13 goes far beyond the table, far beyond foot washing. For what happens at the table is not the final destination, but it's part of the preparation. Here at the table, as Jesus prepares to go into the most difficult and painful days of his life, he sends us out into this world, refreshed and renewed, to do the acts of service. I invite you to read through the rest of chapter 13, and then tomorrow for Good Friday, we will pick up where the text goes from there. As we go this evening, I'm going to invite us to join in prayer, and then we'll close with the Lord's Prayer together. Let us pray. Jesus, as we go into the night with fuller bellies and being washed clean, we do so knowing that we are more like the disciples than we care to admit. We will become distracted, fall asleep, and even deny your presence in the midst of all that is going on. Oh God, we ask that you forgive us. May your Holy Spirit continue to flow before us, above us, underneath, and behind us, pulling and pushing us to the cross, where we discover your greatest act of love. It's in your precious name we pray, we pray the prayer you taught us, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not in temptation, but deliver us from evil. For that is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. As we go throughout this evening, out into our normal way of life, obviously not out into the community, I invite you to continue to hold this moment to be reflecting on those scriptures. And then I'll see you again on Good Friday. <laughs>